Hi. Hi, Senator Hunter. Hello, how are you? And everyone. Doing well. Great. Nice to see you, Ruth. Hello, Cosmos. So how are we, uh, oh, it's 6.01. So should I start? Not yet, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Let's get streaming live on Facebook and we'll get going. Okay. We ready, Julia? Yes. Okay. All right, everything is set. Well, I, I'm ready now. Good evening. I want to thank Chicago Hearing Society for sign language interpreting services and alternative communication services for closed captioning this evening. You can pin the sign language interpreter so it remains in view. I also want to thank Julia Garizminko, my colleague who is running tech tonight. By the way, Julia will be monitoring the chat to collect questions you may have for panelists later in the evening. Please place your questions in chat throughout the evening. Tonight, your audio will be muted. My name is W. Robert Schultz III. I am a campaign organizer at Active Trans. <clears throat> um, our formal name is Active Trans Alliance, but we call ourselves Active Trans. I want to welcome you to the third in a series of Active Trans Justice Talks, where we explore the impact of COVID pandemic on walking, biking, and public transportation. Along with assessing the status of mobility during the pandemic, the Transit Justice Talks look to how, look to how to build back better as part of COVID recovery. Tonight's topic is food access and transportation. Early in the pandemic, Active Trans Advocacy Team was augmented by a team of bus organizing fellows whose charge was to collect and document the experience of public transit riders using their voices and stories to underscore the critical importance of Chicago's public transit system. Rylan Clark, who you will meet later tonight, is the bus organizing fellow who identified tonight's issue and reached into the community, utilizing a survey to find out more. 
at this moment as Congress negotiates a COVID relief recovery package, the importance of having a $32 million budget for public transit systems around the country must be the focus of advocacy this week. You will find out more how to take action on that later tonight. Without federal financial support, it will be nearly impossible for CTA to continue to operate at current service levels. So be sure to pay attention to the call to action later in the program. If you wish to find out more about that issue, check out the Active Trans YouTube channel where last week's rally with Congressman Garcia is stored. Chicago's public transit system, CTA, gets some of its resources, its financial resources, from the state of Illinois. It is for that reason that among tonight's panelists will be two members of the Illinois General Assembly, State Senator Maddie Hunter of the 3rd District and State Representative Delia Ramirez of the 4th District. Unfortunately, both elected officials will not be able to enjoy, will not be able to join us for the entire evening due to late changes in their schedules. Nevertheless, we are pleased to have them for their time that they have allotted to be with us. The journey that led Active Trans to arrive at the intersection of food access and public transportation began when Active Trans conducted a virtual listening tour during the early days of the pandemic, uh, when we talked to over 100 elected officials, community groups, and, and individuals. Active Trans learned during the listening tour that Black and Brown communities have been heavily impacted by the pandemic and public transportation as a lifeline. To help understand where people are living and who are aided by publication and where there are significant transportation deserts, my Active Trans colleague, Alex Perez, will present his findings and some maps to illustrate what we've discovered. Also, as part of this evening's um, presentation, there are these people from the community and we're pleased and very thankful to have them join us. Jan Deckenbach, director of the High Park Kenwood Food Pantry. My good friend and colleague, Ruth Roses, community programs manager of the Consortium to Lower Obesity in Chicago Children, commonly referred to as CLOCK, and Cosmos Ray. He's a member of the Bronzeville Kenwood Mutual Aid Group. I want to thank all the panelists and the elected officials for participating tonight. Let's get on with tonight's business, especially since we have some time constraints. Next, Rylan will start a round of uh, introductions uh, by Round Robin and get into the meat of the program. Thank you. Yes, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Rylan Clark and I am a bus organizing fellow for Active Transportation Alliance and have been since the beginning of this year. I chose the topic of food access and transit intersectionality because food is one of our basic hierarchy of needs and I feel as if the intersection between the two is not often discussed. Um, starting off with our round of starting off with our round of round robin introductions, I'd like to I present the floor to Senator Mattie Hunter. Hello, everyone. State Senator Mattie Hunter from the 3rd Legislative District. Hi. Next, we have State Representative Delia Ramirez. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be with you today. Uh, again, uh, State Representative Delia Ramirez, and I am the representative in the 4th House District which is in the near Northwest side of the city of Chicago. Thank you for having me. Bringing it over to Jan Deckenbach. Hello, and thank you for inviting me to this meeting. Um, 
The Hyde Park Kenwood Food Pantry has been operating for almost 40 years, and um, I've been the director for the last 30 years. Going up next is Ruth Rosas. Everyone, my name is Ruth. I work at the Consortium to Lower Obesity City in Chicago Children, and that's a program that's housed at Lurie Children's Hospital, and we focus on um, physical activity and nutrition. And last but not least, Cosmos Ray. Hey, greetings, everyone. My name is Cosmos. I use he, him pronouns. I'm from Bronzeville, Kenwood Mutual Aid, uh, part of the Mutual Aid Network throughout Chicago. And specifically, uh, I'm here today to talk about food security and food apartheid in the city and the county. Thank you. Next, I will be stopping sharing of my screen. And I'd like to begin the conversation around food access and transit. Um, Cosmos, if you would like to go first, or I can feel free. Uh, sure. I mean, we, we do a lot of stuff based on food security. Uh, we do other initiatives as well, but I know what's pertinent to this group today in this conversation is food security. So as we know, on the South side, there's a lot of food apartheid or what others might call food deserts, but I would talk about their, the intentions of what created them and the systems that created them. So I would call them food apartheid. And we see a lot of our residents, our neighbors, um, they have to come to what we do as a distribution on Fridays, a pop-up, uh, and people will come on the bus many times. Um, the other issue around transit I would also speak to is the, uh, it relates specifically to the access beyond like the distributions mutual aid networks do. And, and that means that like we have to do a lot of food rescue. So as we do food rescue to redistribute food and wealth from across the city and county, there's a transportation aspect that, that's obviously involved in that. But we see a lot of our residents um, that have to travel on the bus to come and get food. And it's a reminder for me that I, you know, I work at a job where I have the privilege to stay home and work because my boss says I can do that. But a lot of people don't have that option. They're told that if they don't come into work, they're going to get fired or if they need to go get their medication, they have to get on that bus. And so when we're talking about a pandemic, when you're hearing this mixed message of you should stay home, and then there's a lot of our residents that don't have that choice actually, if they wanna really survive, that's definitely uh, a contradiction of, uh, of interest to say, or conflict of interest, so to speak. Um, so yeah, I, I think the, just to point out that a lot of people have to travel to get food, medication, and, and go to work even though they're being told not to is an important, thing I'd like to highlight. Thank you. Um, State Senator Hunter and Representative Ramirez, hearing a little bit more about what Cosmos does as well as what Jan does, how do you feel that you can, you can support them, supporting your constituents? Senator Hunter, do you wanna, do you wanna begin? Thank you, sorry about that. First of all, uh, I'd like to thank you guys for inviting me to be, to be with you guys and speaking before you um, this evening. Um, I, I think that um, the beginning is, is tonight, you know, starting to talk to me and, and, and the representative uh, regarding what the situation is and what the needs are. And basically us um, working with, speaking and working with um, officials within the CTA as well as IDOT, Illinois Department of Transportation, to see how we can address the needs um, of the community. I'm um, really happy that you guys were able to um, sponsor the survey. Uh, the survey is always good to know and, and to find out what the pulse of the community is. And so that's a really good thing. And so um, um, I'm here to, to listen, to work with you guys, to see what we can do is to bridge the gap between the community and the Chicago Transit Authority, as well as the Illinois uh, Department of Transportation. As you know, the Illinois Department of Transportation, as uh, Mr. Schultz mentioned earlier, I mean, Smith mentioned earlier, that um, um, uh, there's, a, there's some issues with CTA and 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 just transportation in general i know that the survey stated that um um 
that there are that, that the transportation system in Chicago is unsafe. Um, food safety uh, is an issue. Uh, tra transportation to seek prescription meds as well as groceries is an issue. And that's the only mode of transportation that most people um, uh, have. And so they don't have any choice but to get on the, on the bus or the trains in order to, to live and to make sure that um, their households are safe. And so, you know, I'm willing to do whatever I, I can do to work with you all to bridge those gaps. I really wish that there should have been, that there would have been someone, an alderman or someone from, um, the, from the city that can address the CTA issues. But um, as elected officials, um, we cross over and, and inter, interact with our federal and county and city elected officials anyway. So um, it's no problem. We can do whatever needs to get done actually. Hopefully I was able to address your um, question. If not, then let me know and, and I'll speak further. Thank you, Senator um, Hunter. Uh, would you, did you want me to um, add from my perspective as well? Yes, please. Sure. Oh, okay, so, <laughs> yeah. Well, first let me say to you that it is such an honor uh, to be able to, to be on this panel talking about something that's so critical in our community but also with someone and such a champion as Senator Hunter. Over the last few months, we seem to be in a lot of spaces together. And <laughs> um, in, about, in about eight days, I will no longer be a freshman um, legislator. Uh, so I'm really grateful um, the opportunity. Uh, I think of just the work that, that I've been able to see throughout the years of Senator Hunter and then being able to engage with her on, on so many issues one of those being housing. And I think there's also an intersection of food security and housing access and transportation. So I'm really grateful for that, Senator. Uh, Thank you. Think, and, and I think that as I, as I hear you talk a little bit about the food security, the food deserts, and, and really seeing it as apartheid, so food apartheid, you know, I, I think of this as, as a two-prong. One, there is a short term, we, we have to address this in the short term. And looking at the survey, it is clear that we've had food insecurity before this pandemic in a lot of our neighborhoods and in many of these neighborhoods, at least in the city of Chicago and black and brown communities, um, especially in, in African American communities where the access to food has been a corner store where you get a bunch of sugary stuff and chips and maybe there's like some bread of some sort, but really doesn't address the, you know, the, the nutritional health meals that we would hope our families could have. And so I think that as we think about this, it's also, you know, it's talking about transportation, it's talking about food security and that access that we have not had. And we certainly didn't have before the pandemic. You add then the layer of this pandemic. And we also know uh, that again, unfortunately, those that are testing positive, at least in the city of Chicago, is mostly African-American and Latino again. So, you know, for me, one thing I'd say to you is that we understand that unless we address hunger, we really can't address anything else. And we can't talk about kids in remote learning if they're starving. And we really can't talk about paying rent if you don't have food on your table to feed people and then pay the rent. So to me, there's a lot of intersection there. And it is going to be really critical, I think in the short term, I think Senator Hunter said it so eloquently, for us to be able to champion and, and be advocates with you with access, right? With, with CDOT and CTA, and what are some innovative ways that families that don't have access to a car, but also shouldn't have to go 20 miles to get a grocery store, have access to, to food. Um, what happens when a family or the mother gets COVID and all of a sudden has three kids at home? Um, and, and, and how do we make sure that there's access to food for them? And what does a local neighborhood school look like? So what are some of those things in the short term? And I, you know, I echo Senator Hunter's 
remarks to say that uh, we stand with you to have those conversations, to have agitational conversations with these agencies um, that, that are connecting with transportation. But I also think the second piece of that is, what are we doing to ensure that there's food resources? also available right and that the neighborhood schools have that access so that people could walk over or a family member who doesn't have COVID can go pick up stuff and drop off to family i think in the long term there has to be and i do think this is a place where again with sandra hunter's remarks around the connection and coordination between city county and state and federal will be really critical in identifying pressing emergency legislation that really identifies methods to bring resources to our communities uh, and to make them accessible, but also that instead of focusing so much on not having enough money in the budget, right, identifying ways to have the revenue necessary to put more financial resources, especially in black and brown communities. So to me, you know, to wrap up what I'm, what I, what I'm thinking about as you asked me this question, I think we need to stand with you in the short term and we have to be doing stuff in partnership with you. And this is why that survey is so critical in the long term. And, and I echo Senator Hunter's sentiment to say that I stand in solidarity with you. I ran a homeless shelter uh, for, for 13 years. I ran a soup kitchen. I ran a food pantry. And to people's uh, surprise, it wasn't mostly chronically homeless men who were coming in. It was mostly families, right? Um, so we, we we have to make this a priority and we have to make sure that we protect the current programs that are out there and also increase them. Thank you both so much. Um, picking up a little bit from where you left off, uh, Representative Ramirez, uh, this is a question for everyone, by the way. What, what are ways in which we can tie food access and transportation policy solutions together? Well, I think that um, <clears throat> talking to us today <laughs> is, is a good start, you know. Um, um, if you have any ideas on how to, what kind of, what needs to happen in order to bridge that gap, then, then it's best to talk to us so that we can take a look at the recommendations that you may have if they make sense, if we can fit stuff in, which most of the time we can, we'll get staff to work with you as well as to work with us. And they'll craft some legislation to address those issues. Okay. That's how we get, get the job done. You know, by holding meetings such as this, interacting with folks like you all, because most of the time, this is your area of specialty. It's not ours. It is your area of specialty. So therefore, this is a great start in my opinion um, of bringing the representative and uh, Ramirez and I here, listening to what the issues are. You've conducted the survey, you've talked to other folks, you've talked to one another, and you have some ideals on what's needed to address those issues. And that's when you bring us in, okay? And so you sit down and let us know what's going on, what you're doing, you're, 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 you're doing some of it now, and perhaps additional meetings are probably warranted. And, um, and from there, you know, we'll, we'll hook you all up with our staff and we'll look on the books to see what kind of issues or some kind of legislation, we may have some legislation already on the books to address this issue. And if that's the case, then what we'll need to do is amend that, that legislation. And then sometimes, you know, I, I've been really lucky over the past 17 years that I've served in the Illinois Senate. Sometimes I've created brand new pieces of legislation that has never been addressed, okay? So we can create new legislation, okay? So you, you either amend or you create new legislation to address the issue. And then you all would have to work with me to work through the uh, General Assembly to get it passed in the Senate. And then Representative, since she's on, on Ramirez, since she's on this call, she may uh, want to sponsor that legislation in the, in the House. And then we have to work that chamber over there 
until we can get that piece of the same piece of legislation passed. And then from there, any legislation that passes both chambers, the next stop is to get on the governor's desk. And that's when he signs it into law. And so that's how you get things done down in Springfield. So that's what I would suggest that we do. Or of course, if you have any other recommendations or suggestions yourself, then let us know and uh, we'll take a look at it and see what, what can we do to, to make things happen for you. I, I agree with Senator Hunter. And I think that the survey results that you have um, are also really helpful to really paint a narrative of where we currently are. Like what is the depth of the challenge, right? And what is the connection between transportation and food security? And I think that's oftentimes for us, that is really important to have, right? What is the data that shows us what the problem is? We certainly know that there is a problem. And in our case, people are, people are practically dying of hunger, right? And transportation has, has a role in it. So I think that that's the kind of information that would be really helpful. And I think that just again, amplify what Senator Hunter said around you being the experts around it. Uh, I know that there are some concrete specific recommendations you have and things that you've been thinking about that we would follow your lead on. And, and you know, and, and it's her, and I know you've, you've met with others in town halls, so Senator um, Peters and Alderman Matt Martin and others. I, I definitely think that having a comprehensive conversation with all of them that, you know, who takes on what, but make it a top priority will be important. Uh, in, in the period of time right before the spring session this year, we in the House, we had these working groups. Senator Hunter, I don't know, did you have working groups too in the Senate? Did you oh yeah, we had, yes, we had working groups representative in which uh, I was chair of the Health and Human Services Work Group. And we've held hearings all during the summer. Right, and then we had the Black Caucus Work Groups mm -hmm. in which I was the co-chair in the Senate um, on Health and Human Services as well. And so that's all I've been doing mostly is Health and Human Services hearings since we've been home for COVID since April. Yeah, sure. so it's so interconnected to, to this conversation. Yes. Absolutely. And in the House, there was a food security working group that mm -hmm. Representative Harper was leading. So right. I also think that uh, tapping Representative Harper into the conversation and, and the connections to transportation would also be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, um, just so you'll know, uh, the governor um, early summer appointed me to, 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 to sit on the uh, Hunger Commission. And so that's another resource that I have access to. And then also, um, I'm sure that Representative Harper has spoke with you guys regarding um, the farm deserts, I mean, the food deserts and how she uh, introduced legislation um, to create uh, small farms and com to community organizations regarding the urban agricultural zones. And so I was, she's my rep, and I was the sponsor of that bill, which was House Bill 3418. Um, and then there was another piece of legislation, House Bill 4234, which addressed the challenges of minority farmers face by expanding uh, access um, to state and federal resources. And so, and, and it also created the Farmers Equity Act. And so- Sorry, Senator Hunter. I don't mean to cut you off, I apologize. I just want to make sure you get a chance to hear from Cosmos and Jan, because they provide the food aspect while Active Trans really focus on transportation before we lose you. Yeah, let's go ahead then because I got two more minutes, y'all. I'm so sorry. But I'm speaking at the other meeting as well. And yeah, so go ahead, please, guys. Uh, I can speak real quickly. I would say that, well, I think the legislative aspect is, is, is good and I think policy is necessary. Mm -hmm. um, I think what we're seeing in the United States from national statistics, 15 million more people are food insecure than last year at this time. Um, and what we're seeing is we, we have emergent needs that need immediate response. And I think what mutual aid is maybe the best out of any network is rapid response. I think the legislation, it has its own, it has its own pace. Um, but right now these emergent needs are critical. And I've talked to other, uh, I've talked to our aldermen as well as, as some of the uh, state senators um, mm -hmm. about just getting food immediately, right? Because we know the other stat that always hurts my feelings is 40% of food is wasted in the United States. So there is certainly plenty of food, but because the system is based on profit, it's based on waste and it's based on scarcity and food apartheid, 
these things are intentional. These food deserts didn't just come out of nowhere. They, they were intentionally built this way, right? This, this country was built on that. So I respect the fact that both of you are working within the system, but I think a lot of us have had to work outside of it to circumvent the lack that we see from, from all levels of government for whatever reason. And so I think it, it, while we wait on policy, there's an emergent need that's every day that needs an immediate response. And from a very tangible level, we need to find a way to, to repurpose this food. Maybe we could take the CTA and at night when they have like only a couple cars being filled up, maybe we can fill some of those cars with uh, food and move them across the city to places in need. Maybe we could take some of those buses that are, you know, off duty as they're driving back to the location and fill them. There's all types of ways we can be creative, but this food system is broken. It's been broken. It's based on futility. And so if we are going to really address it, we have to reimagine a new system, in my opinion. Now, I don't know that policy and legislation can do that as quickly as we need. I think long term for infrastructure and local food systems, I think that's going to be the future of this country. I think trying to ship something 1,500 miles from another state when it's unripe and try to get it to sit on the shelf, those days are over. It, we've already seen how fragile this system is. And I don't see what a post-pandemic world is going to, if we go back to that, it doesn't really solve anything. So I, I think if you, if, you can re, if you can imagine beyond the legislation, and find tangible ways to get us food now to the people that are really suffering. I mean, our food pantry lines have been growing. Jan could probably speak to that more. I think that's more what I see is, is the immediate response. Thank you. Is there another person? Yes, Jan, Jan. Deckenbach, yes. Jan, can um, you speak up a little louder, please? Yeah, uh, is this any better? Can you? Yeah, but you're now breaking up. Now? So, yeah, go ahead. Um, so, I applaud Cosmos and his ideas about um, mutual aid networks. I think they are unparalleled in their ability to be nimble and to bring aid to where it's needed, when it's needed. But we need you folks in the legislature to help provide for the infrastructure because Metra and the CTA are hurting financially and they are going to depend on you folks in the legislature to keep them running with subsidies. And so I hope that you'll be willing to bring bills and support bills that keep both CTA and Metra running because I know that people from all over the city have come to our food pantry and they have come from uh, South Shore, even as far away as Heglish and Cicero. And while some of them got rides, other folks, they're riding the CTA and they're afraid to ride the CTA. And so maybe they ride it only part way, but mm -hmm. They depend on it. Yeah, well, I mean, I agree with both of you guys. Um, like I said, I work closely with the uh, food depository. I've been uh, giving, uh, giving food away uh, basically all spring and summer. And I think that um, as well as fall, I just gave away 800 boxes of food. I mean, I, I do stuff like that, but I know that we need an organized effort. And so um, obviously you all aren't happy or satisfied with the, the current system. So therefore we just need to work together to figure it out and, and we'll figure it out together. But I can't figure it out and nor can the representative figure it out on our own. However, if we work together, if you all have some concrete recommendations you know, then, um, and we're not going to solve it here in this meeting tonight, but, um, and perhaps it takes, it, it, it'll, it'll take another meeting, uh, ho hopefully during the daytime. Um, and we need to also, I recommend to you that if you bring us back together again, that you have somebody from the CTA, uh, the Depart Illinois Department of Transportation, as well as, um, uh, the aldermen or many aldermans um, on this meeting so that we can figure it out right then and there. And then, of course, some more meetings are going to have to take place. So that's what I can recommend to you guys, you know, if that makes sense to you all. I mean, that's basically how we get things done. 
you know, we, 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 we must talk to each other. Um, uh, we raise the questions, we raise the issues, and we bring the key people that, that we figure can help us get the problems addressed and solved to the table. And that's how we work things out. Is that okay or acceptable to you guys? Or do you have another recommendation for a format? I agree that the aldermen and women have to be involved because for example, there are a lot of empty storefronts along bus lines that would be perfect, perfect for people to stop by pick up food on a pop-up or on a regular basis. Think about that um, shopping mall at Garfield and the Dan Ryan. I'm not mm -hmm. sure, I don't remember. Is that Pat Let your fellow family yeah. members, friends, and neighbors know about the... So what could be easier for people than to take the red line there or take the 55th Street? and really have access to food. I think the best pop-ups have been the ones that have been along public transportation, even those that were organized truck to trunk, because there are so many people in the city who don't have cars. So you had asked a question about our commitment to protecting um, you know, the services of Metro and CTA at the state level. And I would certainly say to you that you can count on that support for me. And I, I definitely understand that it, it's, it's food, it's also work, right? And, and not being able to have um, access to transportation makes it quite difficult for folks to be able to maintain their job. So, you know, you always hear me say that there's an intersection between all of these things. So yes, I would be happy to support it. And also, you know, I think to your point, this is not a new problem. We know food security, our, our family's been starving for a very long time. And it's a country where we would expect that not to be the case. So I think that, you know, we want to follow lead from you. Senator Hunter has proposed a few ways that we could do that. If, if there is a way, um, you, Cosmos, you gave some really clear, specific ways that we could be actually immediately, like yesterday almost, being able to begin moving some food along from the buses um, to repurposing, um, to, to you know, in a mutual aid kind of way, um, using CTA buses that are not being used or folks that want to volunteer to try to transport. I would be happy to be in any conversations that can help amplify your voice on that. If it's the letter, right, um, to CTA to do that. Um, if it's, you know, to Senator Hunter's point, having a convening meeting with them with some of these things, we want to follow your lead on that. And, you know, I, I can only speak for myself and to say that call us, and I think Senator Hunter has said this over and over, right? We're accountable to you. So get us to do these things. I mean, this is, this is our job. And this is also our communities, right? I come from a family who didn't have shoes until they were 10 years old. So like, this is really close to my heart. And I know to Senator Hunter's. So I want to be as supportive as, you can, as, as we, I can. But I want to, I, I think you're absolutely right. Like there's a policy stuff that takes five months. And then there's people that are dying of hunger, like right now. So I think you could hear from both of us that, count on us as partners for the short term and also like the long-term system change thing because we need both that's correct thank you all representative Ramirez. that's correct so there's some short things that we can do um and there are some long terms dealing with policy but like i said we cannot fix or, or solve CTA's problems, we have to get the alderman to the table because that's the city. As it relates to the toll, Illinois toll or IDOT, Illinois Department of Transportation, then that's us, okay? So, um, uh, and we can address, we can work with them to address whatever transportation issues that affect them. It sounds like most of the issues that you all are concerned with Right now, it's local transportation issues, and that's CTA, Chicago Transit Authority. Yes, <clears throat> excuse me. Unfor we did invite uh, Senator Michelle Harris, excuse me, Alderman Michelle Harris, but unfortunately, she wasn't able to make it. And now we've uh, had a quick pause. I want to give a chance for Ruth Rosas to speak up because she has a 
a lot of experience in this field and she does work with childhood obesity. Um, I guess my concern more is uh, because we work with communities and while CDOT, you know, Chicago Department of Transportation is uh, or are the people that are addressing our local needs. Um, there's still IDOT roads that run now, in Chicago, right? And communities of lots of residents live along them. And uh, those transportation issues still affect them. And so, for example, when bus lines are cut um, or, you know, funding is cut for transportation in general, those dollars get funded into highways. Um, and we know that not everyone uses highways or roads, really, but everybody uses sidewalks. And, uh, you know, people need access to those things. So the prioritization process is confusing um, for local residents to understand. And when they're trying to access these things, it's difficult for them. And they don't understand why certain priorities are taking place. So I guess my question is, how does the how does the state prioritize um, in terms of making sure that our transit systems are being funded and making sure that we're keeping people or giving people the options to stay moving and access first uh, resources if they need them or whatever they may need? Uh, because a lot of times I see this issue uh, with uh, you know the Chicago Department of Transportation being sometimes at odds with the Illinois Department of Transportation in terms of resources they want to provide and so that disconnection is really difficult and so I also feel like that's a reflection of our disconnection with the state with the priorities priorities that um, are not seen because you know people aren't on the ground working with people every day, you know, you're making policy and that's a little bit different. So I guess I'm just wondering how does that happen and um, how do we make sure that, you know, a federal, that money is not just being funneled into highways and roads, but also making sure that sidewalks are walkable because we know that people won't walk if, you know, the streets are not safe for them, if sidewalks are not safe for them. I think you're on mute. Thank okay. You. Thank you. This is the first time that I heard that there were some issues between the city department of transportation and, and the state department of transportation. I wasn't aware of that. Um, what the state of Illinois does is we fund cities, municipalities, townships. Okay. And so we give monies to the city, to CTA every year for operations. We give it to the city of Chicago. Sometimes I dot, I mean C dot, ask for monies uh, specifically. We fund education every year. We fund C dot transportation library. We fund the city of Chicago. Okay, and I believe the majority of their money comes from the state of Illinois, in addition to the taxes that uh, are levied against the citizens. Okay, and so. If you all are telling me that CDOT isn't spending the money the way they should, then I got a problem with that. Is that what you're saying, Ruth? No, it's not about CDOT not spending the money. It's okay, the maybe I misunderstood what you're saying then. I guess what I'm saying is that there's Illinois uh, Department of Transportation roads that run through the city. Right? Of course, of and course. And CDOT does not have jurisdiction on those That's roads. That's true. That's true. And and so, for example, if there, if you want to put a bike lane in so that people are able to ride their bikes so they can access something that's like, you know, five miles instead of, you know, a mile by walking. So the, that does not get prioritized by the state. So how do we advocate so that changes, so that there's more money, so that there's a more funding and this priority that we not only have to fund highways and roads, but also different modes of transportation for people because not everybody owns a car and not everybody wants to own a car. And okay. it, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't, you shouldn't have to depend on a car and pay for insurance and all the upkeep that that, uh, you know, that that costs so that you can access things that you have to access. Okay, Ruth, so in that case, in terms of bike lanes and so forth and so on, if it's a state road that is being impacted by that, you still need to go through the city because that's when the city and the state work together on those initiatives. Now, I know that they've been working together because 
you have bike lanes now all over the city okay and so you have different group different areas within the city as well as the state department of transportation that communicates with one another and they work together and so if there are some additional uh and i do know for a fact that there are some city city streets and roads i mean some state city and and roads that does have bike lanes and so that tells me that there there is communication going on and so if you're saying that more is needed then that's fine then we'll just have to um uh, talk to the folks that does it now i can't think of the name of the um i can't think of the name of the organization that is responsible for helping to get the bike lanes throughout the city uh da, 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 i know jackie grimshaw works for that department she works for that organization and i can't think of the name. technology well yes have you all been working with them because i know that they have a tremendous amount of of, of uh they have i have great influence over the city and the state department of transportation as it relates to those kinds of issues have you talked with them at all ruth yeah yeah well, I, I, through my work we're actually working with them um and so a lot of the you know to improve different modes of transportation um but i guess my my issue is that what we often need is money right um okay you didn't say money beforehand you didn't say money now you're doing okay now so you have to pull it out of people a lot of folks don't don't get to the what the real issues are okay like so you, yeah. you so your organization needs money is what you're saying no 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 it's okay. more like i think that the priorities like where money is being shifted is not what is representative of the needs of the community does that make sense like it i hear what you're saying but i have to disagree with you because if you don't request, did you request any monies from the state, the city or the state? Because if they don't know that you need the monies, then it's not going to go. You have to let folks know what's needed. Now we just passed a forty-two billion dollar capital budget last year, and everybody is asking for money for different projects such as this, and that's 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 capital, you know. So. Have you all talked with anyone regarding utilizing capital funding? Right, right. So this is my point. Yeah. And my question is kind of uh, more like, how do you get communities to advocate? Um, how do you get community, you know, because I work with specific communities, for example, um, I live in South Lawndale or known as a little village, right? We have a lot of issues with environmental justice here because of, um, you know, the coal plant used to be here and now yeah. they're putting, you know, all of these things. And then we have North Lawndale and North Lawndale doesn't have any grocery stores. So um, <laughs> people have to come to South Lawndale, right, to get groceries. A lot of people come here. We have a lot of grocery stores. And so, um, there's not great roads or bike lanes or um, even sidewalks between the two neighborhoods, right? It doesn't facilitate yeah. walking and ease for people to do that if they wanted to. And so I guess I'm just um, wondering, you know, if communities want, community groups want to be advocating for those things. Um, it, it's, it's sometimes difficult because for example, Ogden, I'm pretty sure is an IDOT road. Right, so it, it, there's all of these like different issues that communities are running up against where it's difficult to manage all these things. So I guess I'm not asking anything. It's more just like people aware and especially our right. I get you. that these things okay. are happening in the city and with communities that they're not able to access the things that they want to access because sometimes I think the priorities are not, are mismatched or maybe not known. Yeah, I don't think yeah, it's the pri- Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Senator Hunter. I just wanted to say thank you so much for staying a little bit longer. I really appreciate your time. And I just want to yeah. do a little bit of a time check as well, because we do have to go through our survey. But thank you so much for joining us, Senator Hunter. It's really appreciated. Thank you. But I don't think that it's a missed priorities or anything like that. I think that you need to bring the key people to the table. 
I, I think that's basically what it is, you know, because if you need more bike lanes, if you need more this, you need more that, you got to bring the right people to the table, okay, so that, so that you can bring your issues to them. Today is a good start. Tonight is a good start, okay? So I would like to recommend that you, um, you widen your base and your audience by, by bringing in the alderman, somebody from the mayor's office, somebody from the governor's office that handles transportation for both of them, okay? And, um, and, and um, from, that, from the organization that you just, technology organization, bring them all together. Because I see the, the folks from, um, the folks from um, the technology organization, I see them down in Springfield all the time. So they know the process and they know how to get things done. And I know they do because I, they come to my office making me aware and we pull folks together. We actually can get some things done. Okay. So that's how you get things done. Uh, like earlier, I mentioned that I was on a five hour hearing with uh, Mercy Hospital. Well, the board voted against the hospital to keep it open. Okay, that didn't just happen overnight. Elected officials held press conferences. We had we held marches. We had held all kind of protests. The community came together, the residents, the patients, the doctors over at the hospital. I mean, it was a collaborative effort and folks raised all kind of cane, you know, to get to the action that we received today. And and I've been I've been on 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 my text messages congratulating all of those different entities, including the unions, saying that this is what can happen when everybody come together to work towards a common goal. Okay, and so I know that pressure can be applied. I just think that if you all knew exactly where to apply it at, then we can get some more things done. And I'm willing to work with you to get it done. That's all. I'm, I'm going to uh, interject a little bit here. Um, all right. Just to uh, say thank you because um, you may have forgotten. Anyways, uh, during the last session, Active Trans and some other organizations were successful in getting a $50 million set aside out of mm -hmm. the state uh, budget. Uh, That's right. For uh, walking and biking projects, yeah. Now, uh, and we made sure that there were some um, guidelines with regard to impacting uh, communities where they haven't got disenfranchised communities where mm -hmm. they haven't gotten those resources. Right. So um, you might not have aware, been aware, but Active Trans in collaboration with the uh, State Department of Transportation helped do some webinars um, to outreach to, you know, downstate communities, suburban communities about how to access these funds um, that the state has available um, to, you know, put concrete in the ground and make some of these projects happen around the state. So uh, we provided technical assistance in conjunction with uh, CDOT, and we thank them for that. Um, different, um, uh, what do I want to say, municipal entities have been uh, putting in their projects. I'm not, I guess um, CDOT would be putting them in for Chicago. Um, and then the state is doing an evaluative process um, and so I, I'm not real close to that whole uh, shepherding process, but I'm assuming that we'll hear some announcements for grants uh, during this first round of funding. So um, many people in the General Assembly were quite supportive of that effort. But I think the key that uh, one of the issues is we got the money, People got the energy for these types of things, but um, not all of our governmental agencies like IDOT are sympathetic to the new way of getting around 
And so we're trying to break that paradigm, if you are, and we do have allies within CDOT that, you know, um, see a sustainable future and see the importance of transportation. Uh, but admittedly, you know, um, heretofore it's been a car centric agency. So we're trying to, uh, you know, like a ship, <laughs> it takes a lot of energy to uh, get a ship going in a new direction. And I think that's um, what Ruth was uh, trying to talk about. Okay, so um, in terms of IDOT, uh, we just need to have a meeting during the daytime. That's all. And you let me know and I can make sure that some, we can make sure that someone from IDOT is on the, on the, on the, on the uh, Zoom meeting. We would that help? Yeah. Would that help? Yes, because uh, we've talked to, um, I believe it's Secretary Osmond. I haven't been a, a party to those meetings, but uh, you know we do have a team of people at uh, Active Trans, and we're in regular communication with the uh, mayor's office and CTA. But sometimes it's just getting all of these different entities to really talk to each other. They talk to each other, but what I'm talking is real talk to each other oh yeah well that's what i keep saying sorry to jump in this wasn't my uh opportunity to jump in but uh uh this is one of the areas where i intervene a lot um uh, is around these issues so i thought it was appropriate to uh, uh uh jump in but i don't want to steal the show yeah and you know as it relates to, to clock you know i've been working with clock for a long time i don't know if you know that that um or not, Ruth. Um, um, Matt, do you know Matt Long, Long John? No. You don't I know don't. Matt Long John? I don't. No. Okay. And one of the guys, though, and there's another guy over there. I've been working with them for years with, with Clock on obesity issues, you know, and I've even, we've even worked together to pass legislation, you know, so. Um, I just need to uh, introduce you to some of the people that are involved with uh, with 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 uh, clock because we we've, we've done a lot of transportation and um, obesity uh, issues. I they brought people in so that I can speak to them and lecture them and I mean so I mean we can make it happen, y'all. I mean just we just need to have a meeting during the daytime because. I dot folks, you know, they're working during the daytime. And so uh, we just need to have a meeting and, and all you need to do beforehand, we need to plan it. You just call me and we'll get on the call. I'll get my staff to call around those different departments and they'll be on the meeting. I, it's just as simple as that. Thank you so much. Honestly. As it relates to food, you know, uh, if we need to get someone from the Department of Agriculture from the state on, on that same call, we can do that. I mean, you just need to tell me what I need to do, and um, and we'll get it done. That's yes. all. And hopefully, we can get some issues. We can get some of the get some answers that day, and then start moving forward to address some of these issues. If that's if that's possible, um, you know, I was looking at the chat box, and I think that uh, let's see, Linda Lopez was saying that. We have fragmented decision-making process. I don't understand what that means. And so if she could explain to me so that I can make sure that I get you all what you're looking for. I, I'm not sure what was meant by that. And they weren't sure if I, if I read something, I, I don't know. So what? Yeah, yeah that, was, that was a comment from one of our viewers, I believe. But I wanted to wrap back around to um, the public food access and transit and talk about a little bit more about our survey results because I know a lot of those in the audience haven't had the chance to look over those things and I want to go over those and hopefully get a couple more questions in before everyone has to depart and have a good rest of the night. Rylan, I am so, so sorry. I actually have a 7 p.m. that I'm leading, so I have to get off. I mean, I'm on another meeting. They called me, called my name three times to speak because I, I got them on the cell phone. Um, <laughs> Can you all have a meeting during the daytime? Or I mean, yes, we will. We, we're right here, no, it's um. Right here at the top. It's and mentioned. You guys are the appellant. So I'm sorry. I think two people were trying to talk at once. Phone number and 
Okay, I'm sorry. What did you, what were you trying to say, uh, All right. Mr. Schultz? The next section you want to pay attention to is... Well, I, I'm getting somebody's cell phone in the background. But um, I was just trying to state that we've been in a, uh, you know, we've done a series of town meetings. Uh, we continue to do a ongoing meetings with uh, various uh, players in the field of transportation, CDOT, IDOT. Um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So we'll, we will continue those conversations, and we uh, thank you uh, for for being here this evening. Yeah. Okay, just just let me know beforehand, and um, and tell me what you need, and I can make sure that we get the right people that can get you the answers at the meeting. That's all, guys. I mean, that's what I that's what we can do. Excellent. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm well, thank getting you. off now. Thank okay. you. Take care. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Ruth. Look forward to working with you and as well as Cosmos. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. So thank right. you, for, uh, representatives. Uh, just to, um, I think Ryan Ryland is going to uh, sort of recenter us back on. Uh, we really had to accommodate the. Um, elected officials time. They've been very busy with a lot of things. And um, I think some of this conversation might have been more clarified if we hadn't been uh, so pressed for time and we didn't know that we would have their attention uh, much longer <laughs> than uh, <laughs> they, they promised. Um, so I think Ryland has some contextual stuff that might uh, if we weren't pressed for time, would have been presented uh, uh, previously. So, the floor is yes, yours. yes. Thank you so much. Um, yes, like Robert said, I have um, a little bit of a, comp a compilation of our survey results. Just going to give a little bit of background about everything. So, we Active Transportation Alliance asked questions in our survey about food access and transit as a whole, in addition to food pantry specific questions. And from those results, we found out that from the food pantry specific questions, the biggest complaints about riding transit to go to pantries were feeling uncomfortable because people aren't following or enforcing COVID guidelines, not enough room for their food with how crowded buses are, and pantries being too far away from public transit stops. 62% of respondents who answered food pantry questions said they felt vulnerable utilizing public transit to access food pantries. And most suggested delivery or making a community landmark such as a community center, a pickup point for groceries to make access easier, such as Jan mentioned with those empty storefronts earlier. Um, to the regular results, 67% of people currently riding public transit feel uncomfortable doing so. And that was on a scale from very uncomfortable to very comfortable. Whether or not people take public transit, their three biggest concerns were health concerns, safety concerns, and the waiting times for the buses. To access food, most people take their car, walk, or the bus no more than five miles. Most people don't have to leave their neighborhood for food, but if they do, there is a route that takes them there. Around half of the people who must leave their neighborhood have to leave because of COVID's impact on their neighborhood grocers, and around a third of people have noticed a decrease in bus frequency. And then next, I would like to pass the floor on to Alex Perez, one of the ad advocacy managers here at Active Transportation Alliance, who has been so kind to make these map visuals explaining more. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Alex Perez. I'm an advocacy manager. and. I created these four maps to share today that complement the survey results from Ryland's summary and as well as highlight the intersection between food access and public transit. Uh, the first map on the left is the location of grocery stores and food pantries in Chicago. The lighter green dots are the grocery stores and then the darker green dots are the food pantries. Uh, the data came from the Chicago- oh, I'm sorry, Alex, your, your microphone is breaking up a lot. It's very hard to understand you. Uh, the first map is better. The first map is the location of the grocery stores and the food pantries in Chicago. The lighter green dots are the grocery stores and then the darker green dots are the food pantries. Uh, the data came from the Chicago Data Portal and the Greater Chicago Food Depository. Uh, in this map, you can see the location of the food pantries and grocery stores per community area. Uh, from the map, you can see some communities don't have any food pantries or access to one or two food pantries or grocery stores. 
Uh, as Fallon mentioned, 92 percent of respondents said they felt vulnerable using public transit to access food pantries, and that food pantries are too far from public transit stops. So I mapped the relationship between food access and public transit on the right. Uh, so the map on the right is looking at that relationship. Uh, the darker red lines are the CTA bus routes, and the lighter red dots are the CTA rail lines. The purple circles. The purple circles are a half mile buffer around CTA rail stations to show how many uh, food pantries and grocery stores are approximately public transit. Uh, the further south one travels on CTA, there are less food pantries that are accessible, especially on CTA rail. Uh, when looking uh, north of when looking at the north side of the city, there are more food pantries accessible using CTA. And also looking at far south in the 95th Airline Station, uh, people must rely on the bus if they are using public transit to access food, uh, as mentioned with food deserts, especially if they don't have access to a car. And the next slide. Uh, so the map on the left is looking at the percent of households with zero vehicles, as some of the uh, speakers were mentioning. Uh, this, uh, the percentage of people who don't have access to a car. So we wanted to map that out, and then the data came from the U.S. Census, uh, U.S. Census uh, American Community Survey, and then the darker the color with the census tracks, the higher percentage of people living there don't have access to a car. <clears throat> People who don't have access to a car are more likely to rely on public transit or walking to access uh, to access food. Uh, looking at the map, there is a concentration of people with a car in the west side, the south side, and then the far southeast side corner. There are also more people of color. There are grocery stores and food pantries located nearby the west side and south side uh, hubs where people don't have access to a car. But there, that's not the case in the southeast side corner. And then the map at the right is looking at all, the, all these layers together. Uh, wanted to separate the layers from uh, from each other. That way people could better understand what this last map is showing. And it pretty much highlights the location of grocery stores and food pantries and the accessibility to public transit, as well as the percentage of people who don't have access to a car across the city. And then I'll turn it back to Ryan. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, some of your audio was still cutting out, unfortunately, so it made it a little bit difficult to hear some of that. But um, hopefully we can get these maps available for some people to view so they can view the information themselves as well. Um, I wanted to open the floor back up for more questions. I know that we lost uh, our two state level individuals, but we still have an incredible group of people here and I'd love to foster some more conversations. Um, I had a few questions prepared, or if not someone else can feel free to go. Okay, well, I guess my first question is for Jan and Cosmos. As the High Park Kenwood Food Pantry and the Bronzeville Kenwood Mutual Aid serve the same area, how do you believe you can support each other in serving the community? Well, our food pantry doesn't have a delivery function, although we certainly allow people to pick up for individuals. But if the we could plug into the mutual aid network for people who require delivery um, once they come to our attention. That would be awesome. I also would like to mention that the Greater Chicago Food Depository is making a push backed by um, grants to start more food pantries in underserved black and brown communities. The thing is, of course, <clears throat> that they can't, they can't force anyone to start a food pantry. You have to go to them. So if um, the people in the various mutual aid networks um, find out about this and spread it, the information around, perhaps people who want to band together to start food pantries will find out about these resources that are available to them. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Jan. That's, that's very helpful. And maybe we can connect further. Um, 
even though we're close, we do kind of serve slightly different uh, demographics. And it sounds like Jen is, is uh, your pantry is reaching far and wide, as are we. We've been trying to work on a, a wider coalition of mutual aid groups, especially around food security, because we have to redistribute resources so far and wide that it's wise to, to start hyper-local, like most mutual aid does, but to also uh, band together in a wider coalition cross cross neighborhood solidarity. Um, I think the only thing I would uh, say we've been a little reticent to um, to totally uh, partner with the Greater Chicago Food Depository. Um, I like what they do on a lot of levels, but one of our things is we we focus on solidarity uh, and and instead of charity would be one of the taglines we hear a lot. And I think like something like the Greater Chicago Food Depository when we talk to them. If you go there, sometimes you're required to give an ID, but you know, and so you know, they might check if you're sober. I mean, a lot of that's where I think charity gets a little dicey for us. Is like to us, food is a right. I don't care if you're sober, whatever you're doing. Like, if you need food, you need food. Like, it's not for me to judge. And and like, so that barrier to access, I think, has sometimes been an issue for us. Um, but I do think the food pantries have they do a lot. And I think you're also speaking to another point. Like, we know that people can make it out to a pop-up or actually use transportation. And if they, have that, uh, if they have that agency and they're able to do so, then that's great. But we know there's a population, like we serve a, a couple of folks who are disabled or maybe they're immunocompromised or maybe they're seniors that just don't feel comfortable going out. So we know there's a large swath of our neighbors that aren't getting the support they need. They might suffer in silence because they don't have a support network to express these needs to. And this is true throughout the city, right? So I know we all could do a better job of canvassing our neighbors, especially the, those most in need. If we're, not, if we're not addressing their needs, then what are we really doing, right? Um, and I think that, that effectively does intersect with transportation, housing, uh, you know, abolition, whatever you want to talk about, food security, these things all overlap. And so I think for us, um, we could use a little more support from those in the city that maybe don't have time to volunteer, but if you want to donate food or some other, or some other resource, that would be great. Or if you have time and you want to do some deliveries like uh, Jan's talking about, we get a lot of volunteer support. We're hundred percent volunteer based. So we, we call people up if they're available, they come and do deliveries for us on Fridays um, or we try to do it through some other manner. And then the other thing is we also get a lot of redistribution of resources. So last week, I think, maybe four or five mutual aid hubs from the Northwest side brought food down from the Fields Warehouse on Pulaski and, and Diversity and brought it all the way to the South side. And then we were able to redistribute it as far as, I think like 82nd and Prairie, which it might be West Chatham area. Or no, that's not West Chatham. I think this is Chatham. But we're going, you know, we go to different places, um, but we know that we're not, we're barely scratching the surface, you know? Um, so I think the more we can build a coalition, people tend to function in their own silos. It's an inevitable part of initiative-based work. But the more we identify each other and say, hey, I'm here, this is what I'm doing, the more we can start to talk about our strengths and maybe we can coordinate to, to have a greater impact on our people. There are a couple of questions from the chat that came in as well. Um, Jim O'Reilly says, and please forgive me if I pronounce your name wrong, for Ruth, has participatory budgeting been a successful place for requesting bike lanes in the city of Chicago? And for Cosmos and Stan, how can individuals help your respective organizations? Yeah, so um, I don't personally work too much on bike lanes, um, but I know that there has been some wards who have participated in a participatory budget and have done, um, I know they have done like bikeways and some bike lanes or like the markings on the street through um, participatory budget, so, or budgeting. Um, but the, the problem with it is that not every ward has it. And um, even in some places, like for example, where I live in South Lawndale, um, when bike lanes did come in, uh, residents felt like they didn't have a voice when they came in. Um, so there was some pushback on the fact that perhaps bike lanes wouldn't uh, would take away parking or there was like um, misconceptions about the fact that bike lanes were coming and so I think obviously if you have participatory budget in your ward that's a really great way to get some of these things to happen um, but it doesn't bypass the fact that you still need to communicate with um, people right I mean in your ward where you live that uh, 
these what these changes could bring because I think um, what I hear a lot in my work is that people are often left out you know the people that are living there are often left out of these decisions um, and they don't hear about them and I know it's hard to communicate with that uh, with them about everything that's happening but I do think that we have to have more intentional um, public engagement when th these things are happening especially for transportation because they affect so many people so I know they have been successful, um, but uh, it, it just depends whether your ward has participatory budgeting or not. Uh, Jen, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'll just uh, paste in here uh, our link, which has some ways you can, you can volunteer, you can donate. Um, I would say in general with mutual aid, uh, it's something that starts hyper locally and it's, its foundation is engagement with your neighbors. So if you live in a building, make sure you're talking to your next door neighbor, ask them how they're doing, maybe cook them a meal if they need it. Uh, then from your building, start with your, your block and then your whole street and then expand from there. And the more we get in tune with each other, the more solidarity we'll have and the more we can circumvent the lack that's created by these systems that really don't work. Um, I would say if you're interested in direct support, you can volunteer with us as a driver or come to our pop-ups and, and you know, you can, you can certainly assist us that way. Um, you can also assist us with organizing if you want. There's a lot of initiatives we're trying to tackle or at least partner with other organizations to do so. And I think someone asked a question about deliveries. We don't deliver to High Park per se, although we have. There used to be a High Park mutual aid. I think maybe they haven't been as active. But we, I think we're at our height, we were doing about 50 deliveries a week. I think lately it's been more like 20, but we serve about 150 to 200 families a week, depending on how it goes. Um, and I think we could definitely expand if we had more capacity to do so, because there's much more need than we're, we're covering. Thank you. For our part, Right now, the best way to help us is through financial donations. We have, um, we have to keep our volunteer crew small because of maintaining physical distancing during our distributions. So right now, we're, we don't need additional volunteers. But even though the food depository is giving all the food we get from them for free, we are still needing to purchase food in order to provide fresh produce, especially to our recipients. And that's something that we want to give a lot of every single distribution. But I understand Cosmos's concern about barriers. While we don't um, require ID, we do ask people questions such as where they live, what their names are, how many folks are in their household just to, because we're required to be part of the food depositories auditing. You know, we give away federal food and so I sign federal contracts and so this is part of their accountability structure. But um, we do give food to everyone, even, even if they decide that they need to be disruptive for whatever reason. <clears throat> and for that reason, actually, we could probably use some mental health folks. Another question came in from the chat from Kelly Milan. Uh, who do people contact if they want to kickstart a food pantry? Well, if you want to start a food pantry that is a member agency of the Greater Chicago Food Depository, they are the people to contact. But again, as Cosmos pointed out, there are rules and expectations that go along with membership. But if people just want to start their own thing, I would be happy to talk to anyone who wants to know sort of the logistics and 
things to look out for when you're starting a food pantry. Um, I have a, another question for all of our panel members. In what ways can food access advocates and public transit advocates like myself work better together? Besides here, doing this right now. I don't want to dominate, but I'll just say this quickly. Um, I think that what happens a lot in this hierarchical world is that the people that have the most need often are the least heard. So what I see and what I'm humbled by by going out in the street and talking to folks is the stories that I hear and, and what they're telling me their experiences are. And as mentioned, like how much of a privilege I personally have, like I can stay home from work, um, but they have to risk um, maybe, co you know, the, the threat of COVID to get on the bus to go through many things they have to do daily. Um, so I think listening to the community, I think most of our communities have a lot of the answers. I know some of the policymakers said that, you know, maybe, maybe they would legislate and that's all well and fine. But I, I do think a lot of our community members have a lot of the answers we're looking for. They might not have access to the resources and they certainly don't have access to the, to the power structure that, that could maybe make those changes. Yeah, I, I think that uh, in general for me as well, like talking to the community members and working with them directly has opened up my eyes into the everyday needs that people have. And then thinking about um, ways that we can elevate their position so that they are, um, you know, the ones making decisions for their communities. Um, I know that sometimes like that's the point of our elected officials, but sometimes our elected officials, because they have such a wide area to cover or because they can't get so granular, it's hard. And so um, there has to be some kind of method to, to, to hear about those things um, from the community. And I think I definitely see my work um, trying to contribute to that. So, um, but also hearing what other people are doing, um, even if it's not within my realm of work, I think working with other individuals you know when i hear about food access um you know when i do walkability assessments with people we talk about with places that they need to visit or places that they need to go or places that they don't have in their communities and these all, all these things are inter intersecting with their daily lives and they don't see it as separate they don't see like food access as a separate thing and so um, or, you know, transportation or going to the doctor, or, you know, healthcare access, that's not a separate thing. So I think that we need to view our work that way too and be educated um, about these things and not just stay in our realm and not working within silos because that fragments, like Linda said, that fragments us too much and then we start making decisions that aren't um, actually benefiting our communities. So I, I, yeah, I definitely very much echo what Cosmo said. And Jan, I, I don't know if you had anything to add to this conversation or the specific question, excuse me. I do know that um, the people who come to the food pantry are very concerned with transportation. Uh, most of the people I would say walk. Although that may now change that the weather is getting bad, but we've never had any more than say two thirds of our recipients come in a vehicle and under those circumstances, people were sharing vehicles. For example, they borrowed one and gave some other people a ride. So, you know, a little mutual aid springing up right there. And I have noticed that while waiting, because people come so often, they've gotten to know each other. And so people, even before they um, receive what we have to give, they're helping each other out.
I believe we have just enough time for one more question. Um, my last question for all of you, thinking about yourselves as service providers, what do you believe is a good basis for, what do you believe is a basis for a good public transportation system? I, I guess for me, it's um, making sure that we are, uh, or that we find money to make sure our sidewalks um, are properly paved and um, safety. I think that's the things that I hear most often. You know, people are accessing transit by walking often. And so um, if you don't give them, you know, a safe way to get there or, um, you know, nice sidewalks to walk down, then uh, people won't choose to do that. Uh, and so I think, you know, if we want people to be, feel safe and comfortable using public transportation, um, and there needs to be a foundation of walkability and um, safety. It's a difficult question. I mean, we're, we're living in a system based on profit. Uh, the CTA has to ha make a certain level of money to, to exist. And I know they're subsidized by the, the local and state government because I think they've, they've said they, they don't always meet their budget, right? Or, or their required revenue. Um, so to me, the issue is more about accessibility and sometimes that is determined by a commercial area or whatever population maybe that that is maybe you know giving more to that system but the the areas that maybe have the least ex access to some of the things we're talking about whether it's food apartheid uh, exacerbating their access to food or as uh rule said whether it's them traveling to get uh go to the doctor etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, they a lot of a lot of our neighbors are the ones that need it the most and don't have access because we are driven by profit on a lot of levels. So I don't know how you solve that issue in a in a system that is totally based on capital, but I think access is really the problem, right? Or uh, one of them at least that I see with CTA and some of the other uh, public transportation systems. I mean, if you look at Metro, that's even like another class level of access, right? So yeah. I believe it's right about time to wrap up. So I'd like to show everyone after Transportation Alliance's call to action. Right now we are asking for emergency federal funding to support Chicagoland Transit. It is estimated that by March of 2021, all federal funding will be used, which is very much an emergency in, in my eyes. Um, next, sign up to testify for the community hearing on Transit Equity 2021. It is on Rosa Parks' birthday. This link has more information available for you all. Thank you everyone for coming. Please be in touch with us. Listed below our emails, our blog, web information, and the information of every active transit person who is in attendance. And of course, our panelists, please feel free to drop your information as well if you'd like to be contacted. And that is all I had for everyone.